Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, August Simonelli. I work for, I'll step up, I work for uh, Red Hat. I'm in the product management team, so I'm not a developer, I'm not a um, SRE or anything. I've done those roles. I used to work on OpenStack. So what you're going to see today is maybe a little different, at least for me, that you've seen in some of the other presentations. Um, I'm not going to pick apart an API or give you a good design blueprint or go into a network protocol. And that's probably good, considering there's eight of you in the room, and <laughs> they don't know what they're missing. And that you can probably hear the clang of the drinks happening out there. So we'll, um, we'll probably get through this quickly. But what are we actually going to talk about? Let's make sure that's working. Yeah. I'm going to tell you a story today, um, something that uh, makes all the things that you do in your day, your CRDs, your APIs, your code, it's something that makes it all work. Um, it's not a technical solution, but it is something that you need to make all this work. And that's the story of open source um, and of community. And um, it's not something you probably don't know. In fact, I assume everyone in here does because you're here. But it's something we need to be reminded of. It's also something with AI coming down, barreling down on us, that I think we have a lot to learn about. Because we're kind of looping, as we'll talk about in this presentation, back to some old habits. And so as a Red Hatter, it's important that we remember how we got where we got. So kick back, relax for the next, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. And let's take a look at the history of the Open Cluster Management Project. So let's take you back to 2017. It's eons ago, right? Star Wars Episode Eight is the top movie. And that should really set your context, right? It's like, I don't remember that time. And IBM released a platform called IBM Cloud Private. Has anybody used this? I mean, I can actually interact with you all. You've used I OK. Do you work for IBM? Yeah. OK. Phew. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, that's good. So the idea behind IBM Cloud Private was that it could uh, bring public cloud inside, right? And so when they released it, we had a, a press release, or IBM had a, I didn't work for IBM then, but we had a press release that said um, this. IBM Cloud Private is a platform designed to enable companies to create on-premises cloud capabilities similar to public clouds. Cool, right? Makes sense. With the goal of accelerating cloud-native application development, nice, and supporting modernization of existing applications, cool. And then this, running on IBM technology, such as WebSphere Liberty, DB2, and MQ. So it was very specific. It was not intended to create uh, a cloud application platform for the masses. It was to containerize IBM technology and make it run on premises. And it used Kubernetes and Docker and all these other cool things, but it really had that goal. Um, that was the whole point. Um, and so we got a lot of press that came out about it. And I, I love this headline. So this is from a chief architect at IBM, um, Hatham Ekhoja. And I just love that it's IBM Cloud Private in plain English, right? We, we needed it defined a little bit. So IBM Proud Cloud Private is a platform to develop modern applications based on microservices architectures. Cool, right? This is, this is what we should be seeing. Behind the enterprise's firewall, OK, that's a kind of weird way to say it, but kind of IBM, while consuming IBM catalog of middleware and software. So we're really there, right? It makes sense, but it's closed. OK, why am I talking to you about this? Well, because in 2018, that's actually not too bad. What's happening is we have these massive cloud providers dominating. AWS, who I think speaking in the other room and probably has 85 people in there right now, is um, kind of pulling everything away from on-premises solutions, pulling everything, you know, things away from the data center. Um, and so the data center is becoming a mishmash. Uh, OpenStack, which is what I used to work on, is there. And I mean, that was easy, right? OpenStack was simple. Um, Anyone use OpenStack in here? Yeah, right. So it was a nightmare, right? And then on top of that, um, things like um, traditional virtualization were still in. I mean, look, even OpenShift 4, that wasn't out yet. Good old OpenShift 4. So that hadn't happened yet. So we, we were struggling. So look, to be honest, this idea that IBM Cloud Private is, as they say, a universal platform for IBM middleware and containers, it's not a bad one, because what they're bringing in is all kinds of things. You can see here stuff like management and compliance. You can see hybrid integration. You can see um, Kubernetes. You can see orchestration. These are important things. Um, and when I spoke with former IBM employees, because they work for Red Hat now, uh, they loved it. They said it was like a little startup. That's a quote, a little startup. And, and I think that's neat. I mean, I really like that. And even when you look at this slide and how they're presenting it, this, this I don't even know if I'm supposed to be showing this, and I, I don't really mind, but it's history, right? It's an artifact. 
this is how they were presenting it. And I think you could present something similar like this today. So the, the message was there, right? The, it was on, on track. Maybe part of the challenge is it was more about integration. It wasn't necessarily about a full upstream community. We'll, we'll go into that more. So they would come up with things with clever little names like IBM, IBM Microclimate. I mean, that's a cool name, right? And the idea was then to, to bring all these cool upstream pieces in and build them out for the internal platforms. And if you look at this, I'm gonna step away from Mike. If you look at this, I could do this today. I mean, look, there's a dev portal there. I mean, right backstage, I mean, this is me. So it's happening there, and there's actually a link on there um, to a YouTube video that introduces this, and, and that stuff's out there. Um, so again, you're looking very much at an open source idea being pulled into IBM and used for its customers. Again, I, another one of these great slides. Look at this stack. Isn't this cool? You go to the very top, and there's your IBM. Okay, important, right? That needs to be there. That's what they're trying to do. Look at the one under it. Orchestration, um, monitoring, logging, security. They weren't creating all this themselves. They were bringing it in. They were, they were going upstream and pulling stuff in to run IBM Cloud Private. I mean, even the name, though, is a bit, yeah. Of course, they named it IBM Cloud Private. But it empowered their users to feel like they were getting the best of, of those worlds. IBM was IBM, and it was good, um, but it was complex. And so to run all this, they came up with something called IBM Multi-Cluster Manager, and that's kind of the beginning of our story, MCM. Because all this tech was super complicated and confusing and hard to do, and no one really had an offering, they created a single pane of glass for ICP. Um, and they introduced the video with a one-of-a-kind product with a lot of capabilities bundled in. And I love that because, I mean, that's, and I love IBM and they pay my mortgage, but uh, that is a wonderful statement, right? It is, it's, it, it's kind of neat, but it says absolutely nothing. So what they put in it was um, mostly cluster lifecycle management, big problem, difficult, and application-centric uh, stuff and policy. So the app-centric stuff was like GitOps. It was different, a slightly different model, but it allowed the deployment of apps um, through code, mostly. Um, so it's pretty cool. And what else was out there at this time? There wasn't a lot. There wasn't that much that could be done. Um, so for IBM's customers, they were in a pretty good spot, right? It was really kind of happening, and it, it was good news for them. <clears throat> but it remained IBM Cloud Private. IBM software, IBM middleware sold with open source stuff, but only internal, right? And so even the developers, I sat down with a bunch of them in, um, virtually, and they said, we loved it. It was great. And I said, did you ever get to work upstream? Uh, yes, but we didn't contribute back. OK. And now, remember, we're still in like 2017, 2018. So obviously, that stuff was happening. But they didn't think too much of it. It was OK. It was good. They were building good software. Um, they were involved. But it was all brought inside and, and for that purpose. So 2019 comes, and late 2018 comes, and they're churning away ICP, and it's an application platform, which is a good thing, right? It's all the pieces you need. And then something happened in 20, late 2018, 2019. Does anyone know what happened? Yes. Hi. <laughs> they bought Red Hat. Um, so uh, IBM decided it was time to, to find, to, to, to redirect that open source spirit that they actually had internally um, and really uh, accentuate it. So in October of 2018, they bought us. And then in um, mid-2019 uh, mid in July, they um, actually finished the acquisition. And that's a big number. I think it was bigger than that. I, I, I don't know. But it was, it was a big number. Um, the problem for IBM that happened there is IBM Cloud Private kind of did what OpenShift did. Or should I say OpenShift was on its way to doing what IBM C Cloud Private did. So when you look at those pieces that were in there, we have all these open sourcey type of things and ways of doing things. A lot of this is, is in OpenShift or was on its way into OpenShift. So they actually shut down ICP. And this is where the story gets interesting, right? So we have MCM, multi-cluster manager. And it's this closed source, very IBM thing that's doing very good things, making the company a lot of money, uh, wrangling all this great stuff. And now the main platform gets shut down. And yet 
it's a good time because they knew how to do multi-cluster management. So suddenly, MCM becomes the key. It becomes the piece that IBM wants to try to push back out and say, look, we've learned how to do this. We want to open this up because we want to make this better for everyone and because that's what Red Hat helps us to do. So they wanted to really make this something that IBM and Red Hat would focus on, multi-cluster management, because there wasn't much going on in, that, in those days. So a strategy was created, um, and this is where it works at Red Hat, right? When we acquire companies, and I've seen plenty, I've been at Red Hat for over 10 years, when we acquire companies, we, we open source everything. So when we got cloud forms, we open sourced it. People said it wouldn't happen or, oh, we can't get that done we require it. There's just really no going around that. You have to bring it, you have to open it to productize it. It's just a necessity, it's a requirement at Red Hat. So that was gonna happen to MCM. And that's kind of neat, but how do you do that? How do you open source something that's closed? You know, are you throwing this thing on the scrap heap? Is it gonna become something that you can't make money off of? And I mean, it's cool to be open, you know, bless the CNCF, that's what it's about, but we're also in this to make, to make money so we can fund it. So what do we do? We come up with a plan. And this is the original slide with some slight alterations for um, public consumption to talk about the open source strategy in 2019. So it's simple, a project for multi-cluster management assisting customers to easily manage their environments. And that's pretty cool. And so what happens inside of Red Hat is we have a open, uh, Red Hat open source program office and they work with the new piece of software, whatever, and they create an upstream um, project. And that's where OpenClusterManagement.io came from. So now we're going to evolve from MCM to OCM. We um, have all the legal and business approvals and naming that has to happen, and Red Hat shepherds that. It's something we know how to do very well. Um, we also have core Kubernetes contributors like David Eads and Paul Mori, who had actually been at IBM, who were at Red Hat. They're adding to this. They're helping to write a community charter. Again, IBM's taking a risk here. It's going, oops, it's going, am I going to lose this thing? Is this, is this, you know, have we lost something? Are we going to have to hand this out? But they ran with it. Um, and so they mostly focused on this kind of server foundation piece and the app lifecycle, the, the toughest areas to do. So once we have a plan, 2019, we have some action. And the first thing that has to happen is they transfer all the IBM uh, developers, project ownership, all the people floating around that, into uh, Red Hat. It's not a condemnation of how IBM is run, but there's an understanding that to be contributing to the community, you need to be part of that community. So I asked the developers, oh, you know, did that make you nervous? And no, not at all. They loved it. They loved that they could move over. They had been kept in a fairly um, closed space, and so now they were being able to, to kind of see what else they could do. The next thing they did is they encouraged them to work in other upstream projects. So one fear we all had at IB, uh, Red Hat when IBM bought us is, you know, oh, are we going to be stopped from working upstream and all this other stuff? No, that doesn't happen. We have never had issues with that. From day zero here, this was encouraged. And so they're contributing other things. But they did need to rebuild. So they actually rebuilt a lot of MCM from scratch. So it became the knowledge, became the information they had in their heads of how to make open source software work together, which isn't the easiest thing, which is OK. But that skill, that people skill, uh, an engineering skill, is what was so important. So it was decoupled from the IBM products and rebuilt with a modular architecture, which kind of was there. It would now run on any Kubernetes, so it wasn't ICP based or whatever version of that would be. Um, and it was fully open source, so you had Git repos, you had a Slack channel, uh, YouTube channels, all that kind of stuff. Like, it was flying, so things were really, really going, you know, well. We were seeing how we were taking this private thing that IBM had and turning into something more. And so, boom, we're going and 2020 hits, right? And without going into a sideways thing about the pandemic and how it messed things up or whatever, um, we did hit the pandemic year. Um, and that was actually not that big a deal for this project. So in mid-2020, actually around April, we actually produced the first productized version of, of OCM. And we called it Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. So now this MCM team that had been involved with ICP, had been involved with you know, making all this stuff work, was really focused on that management space. They were now in, the, in, in Red Hat, they were dealing with all the pieces that Red Hat has and bringing it in and trying to manage it. And then upstream, this, this same, there was a really exciting change happening too, where this tool that was originally all about rolling up IBM stuff and making it amazing was now um, 
able to be productized, but also as a community upstream. And so you have this whole basis for um, a commercial offering sitting on top of a standards thing happening. The ability to say, okay, we're not just a tool, but we're also a standard. And, and I really want to double click on that. When you talk about a cluster manager, you're talking about a specific tool or software that's responsible for something, for orchestration or whatever, and it needs to be open source, right? We, we don't question that. And that's super important, and everyone in here gets that. But when you want to take that to the next level, you want to look into cluster management, right? This is a process or an ecosystem. This is the tools. Most importantly, this is the community that surrounds the management of multiple clusters. So we go from a cluster manager, multi-cluster manager, to the open source, uh, or sorry, to the open cluster management project or Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management, however, you, whichever way you come into it. But the key is that we've now put the community and the standards first. So we've evolved from MCM, we've gone to OCM, and we're now starting to form a community. So we need to get it out there. Yeah, Red Hat can sell it. I don't know how well it sold in, in 2020, um, but it was out there and we were talking about it. Small disclaimer, I am in the product management team for ACM. So this was sort of a, a labor of love for me because I joined the team and I was like, what is the history of this thing? So that's where I came. So I feel passionately about ACM, but I was just really curious how it came together. So 2021 comes, and we get out there, and we're able to start sharing again virtually, and we're going to introduce it. So the engineering team gets to introduce it at DevConf USA. So Mike uh, introduced it. Now, he was an IBM employee, and now here he is at an open source conference sharing his piece of software. And I sat down with him like a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this, and he, he goes, open cluster management is really about being able to bring together many different parts of the community and deliver a holistic solution to simplify fleet management across the open hybrid cloud at scale. I mean, what a turnaround, right? So he's, he's now really into it. And he's speaking of community and not tooling. It's not just about bringing stuff in and making it work with IBM. He's talking of standards and not just integrations, not IBM microclimate, but literally, let's be a community around how we control multi-cluster. And when you look at their original slides, they're really cool because it's all shifting away from having our branding and, and all this other stuff to looking at what the projects are doing and creating a managed cluster API that we can present to those projects. So they can come in and say, ooh, clusters are getting big and popular and everybody wants to do it. We need a simple way to manage many clusters. So when you look through like the Argo docs and stuff, you'll see references to the OCM project and to the managed cluster API. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's a huge evolution and that's being, you know, strongly worked on by that IBM team, which is now a Red Hat team upstream and, and building that out. And it's global. Mike's in Canada. Much of the team are in China. So it's, you know, it's really kind of neat. It's coming together. Um, and so then we are able to actually um, produce this, this piece of software that does a lot. You'll see different pieces in there. We have OpenShift Hive in there. Okay. Cappy is probably going to happen more a bit there. We'll see what happens there. But um, we have a governance and compliance framework. We have uh, cluster manager running. Um, the clusterlet idea is there. Argo, OPA, things like that are starting to use it. And this is making it much simpler for the community to join and add and to tr try it out, see what will happen, see how they like it. So 2022 hits. We start opening back up. And uh, I use that as a metaphorical key for our, our journey because OCM takes its next big step. And in 2022, OCM was donated and accepted into the CNCF as a sandbox project. So the founding members that are Ant and Alibaba, Red Hat and IBM were able to offer a managed cluster API in a way so that everyone can represent Kubernetes clusters. That meant things like community meetings start happening. It means external companies can get more easily involved, can feel less uh, challenged by the environment they're working in. Um, and it, it's valuable, as Mike said, there's a difference between uh, open sourcing something and building a community around those open components. What this mostly means is the governance becomes neutral. And I think that's something that probably everyone in this room understands. But when we look at the history and how we need to go forward with things like AI, which we'll touch on, um, we need to really be in that spot. We need to make this stuff remain neutral and accessible to lots of vendors. It doesn't mean we don't make it something they can sell and, and make money off of, but we have to stay in that space. It's not just 
open source and okay, that's good. It's actually creating those communities around that to make it work. So OCMIO was mostly foundation, app lifecycle, and governance, but they're adding things into it externally, like insights, telemetry, better user interface, stuff like that. That's coming from the community and helping that product and project grow. And now the focal point is the SIG, uh, SIG multi-cluster, right? I think they had, is anyone part of that SIG in here? I, so I can say this, and if I get it wrong, you just ignore it. But um, I think they had a thing called KubeFed, and that got retired. So it was Kubernetes Federation across things, and it was another tool, not really a standard. But once OCM kind of started popping up in this space, um, it was a really good place for adjacent projects like Argo to adopt this multi-cluster standard to at least participate in this. They could then use a common Kubernetes uh, SIG multi-cluster approved API, right? And so now everybody feels comfortable using it. It's open. Multiple vendors are getting in there. Things are happening, and it's, it's, it's better, right? I think it, it's how we want to be. OK, so 2023. And I went through a lot of different versions of this slide with weird AI-generated calendars, and they were really strange, or cats with like 48 toes and, you know. I just stuck with this one, right? Because we need to talk a little bit about AI. And what happened in 2023 is ChatGPT unveiled what they had. I know it's been there for some time. And suddenly it became mainstream. It became something that, we, that, that, that the consumers and customers were like, oh, I need this. I, I, need, to have, I need to have something in my, in my uh, developer environment. My fridge needs to tell me what to make for dinner. Um, these things are going to come, right? So the problem is, is that when this got released, this very popular one from OpenAI, the LLM was very closed. And that's not great because we're kind of setting ourselves back again. And we're being forced to choose between proprietary options again. We're saying, OK, the LLM is closed and the access to it is somewhat closed. And that's kind of wasteful. So, and it creates a bit of fear. We're right back to where we were, where if like, things like MCM had been kept closed, no one would jump on board, and we wouldn't get these multi-cluster standards. So we're in a kind of dangerous spot. So we need a few things. And we need to have open LLMs, and we need that community to build and, and work with them. And we do have open LLMs, um, Open Llama. Um, I, think, I think OpenAI is doing one. IBM has the Granite model. And that's really cool, because suddenly now developers and makers and tinkerers and everything are, are going, oh, I can pull an LLM down, and I can do something. And remember, I'm back in time a little bit. In the last 12 months, even, this has exploded, so that you could see demos like you just saw. Or oh, if you were in here, uh, we saw um, a chat Oops, a chat bot inside of um, Backstage. That made this happen more quickly, so that we could actually have these open, open um, tools. So that's really cool. but. Again, like OCM being open, it's just a tool. So we actually need more. We need something like a community that gets built around it. Remember what Mike said. There's a difference between open sourcing something and building a community around those open source components. Good to have it open. Let's open those LLMs, but let's make them accessible. One example I have of that is Instruct Lab from IBM and Red Hat. So what we've done there is you can use, you can pull an LLM down and then interact with it and train it with uh, a free um, a CLI. So you can start to play with it. You can start to see how this stuff works. Yes, it's not, we're not there as completely open AI. Or, bad example. Whoops, bad example because of the branding there. But, but what we have is now a community starting to interact. I had never tra trained an LLM. And then you know, they said, check this thing out. I get on there and I, I taught it to like, I said, what is OpenShift? And I said, it's a brand new washing machine. And I got the thing to answer that way. And then I thought, oh, that's weird. I can do that. So I tried submitting that up to the code so that others could take it and it got denied. A human looked at it and said, it's not a brand new washing machine. So I'm now getting to see how these things get trained. You know, we worry about what's in this data. Fine, keep them, keep them somewhat closed. Uh, you know, protect your data, but we need to know how they're born and how they work. We need to know the community around them and how they exist. And that allows like developers and students and everyone to start to play with this tooling a lot more. So what's next? Um, I don't know, but I feel like we have a blueprint. When we, what we saw IBM do with MCM, kind of take its hands off, let it go, it turned into something. Red Hat has been able to productize it, which is not a dirty word. It's not bad. We saw success. We saw that it, it was okay to open these things up. And I think that 
for these companies that are still kind of holding on to that, we need to reteach them as members of this community as well. We need to let them know this does work. You won't lose things and you'll still make money. Your shareholders will be happy, whatever it may be, it's important. So what we really need to remind them is simply this, open makes AI and everything else better. If we build communities and not tools, we'll have a much broader understanding of, the, of what we're doing. So I'm gonna summarize up in a couple of lines here and then we'll release to the drinks and everything. But when it comes down to it, we need to build open source, open communities and open standards, that's obvious. Collaboration and interaction allow those upstream communities to work together and that creates a much stronger ecosystem. Once MCM actually landed upstream before it was working as a standard, it just, it, it just invited collaboration and it just grew. Um, we probably could have kept ICP around. It, you know, it, it was all contributing. Open standards help upstream projects utilize shared APIs, so they focus on core work and you don't waste time duplicating effort. I, I think we have a lot of duplication, even today. There are 50, 60 different versions of the same thing. That's okay as long as they're based on a standard, and we have to keep that somewhat aligned. We need to use the multi-cluster standard for multi-cluster and then grow that out. It doesn't lock it into anyone, but it grows out. Okay, making things open leads to solid foundation to create powerful productized versions. And I, as a Red Hatter, for many that's a horrible thing, but I think that's a wonderful thing. We need to be able to, to profit from these things. We need to be able to sell them. We need to be able to fund more innovation. So it's important to be able to productize them, to sell them, and to support them as long as they go back up into it. Because you're also a consumer of this tooling, right? You're fridge is telling you what to make for dinner and you want to have a hand in how that's how that's going to work and finally this brings our customers and our communities and our users and not just the tools but together for freedom innovation and a future and it's a little bit dr dramatic i know but where a technology empowers us all to do better which is kind of a neat way to end the conference because i spent the day listening to lots of really really cool stories but i really want to know at you know at the end of the day does it work and I think it does. And I think we can take a little version like OCM and show that even a company as big and old and creaky as IBM can take something like that and take a risk and let it go through this process and succeed. So when it comes to these AI tools, I would really, really, really like us to remind our colleagues who are working in these spaces that it does work. It doesn't matter how many are you know, floating around and, and, and you're worried that you're going to not be able to do it, it does work. And how do you do that? You join. Check out what we're doing in these two communities. Share your communities. You do this already, but just keep in mind that today we may need refreshers on some of this stuff, right? We may need to be able to revisit where we were 20 years ago when this all started, or 40 years, depending on how old you are. Bring them back to that. Tell them those stories. Make sure it stays alive because we're kind of going to take it. We're, we, we are at risk of taking things for granted a little bit. And that was really it. And I was really pleased that the CNCF accepted the submission because it certainly wasn't as, you know, like, I don't know, you're not going to walk out of here and, and, and instantly code because of this. But I love that I could share this with everyone and, and I really do appreciate you, 10 of you, staying for that. It's, it's really cool. So thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. <laughs>